Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhillslv.com to watch or listen to past messages. We hope you enjoy today's message from God's Word. Amen. I'm glad to be here too. I always get nervous when we start clapping because my wife always tells me, stop it. Because I always am off clap. I'm just a little bit off clap. I'm just like not there like you all are. But I did pretty good today. In fact, in the first service, she looked over and she said, you're doing okay. She's critiquing my worship of Jesus. We are glad to have you in church today. We're going to have a great time as we study the book of Mark, chapter number 10. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. If you didn't bring a Bible, that's okay. We're going to have most of the scriptures on the screen today. But I'd love for you to follow along in a hard copy of the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, I'll give one to you. Let me know. Mark, chapter number 10. Now, a little quick announcement by way of introduction, and that is this. If you have a cell phone today, go ahead and pull it out. You can follow along on your cell phone if you want to, but go ahead and turn off the ringer because there's nothing stranger uh, in a church than cell phones, you know, going off. And the, I mean, these devices are too much anymore. You know what I'm talking about? Like, we don't need these devices everywhere that just bother me to death, especially in church. Oh, hold on. There's one. Oh, this is for the sermon. Yeah, this is my prop today. And you're going to say, how does this fit into Mark chapter 10? We're going to see so in just a moment. We begin a brand new sermon series entitled, Hashtag No Filter, The More Beautiful or More Beautiful Than You Ever Expected. First sermon is entitled, Misunderstanding Messiah. Do you see Jesus? When you look at the Jewish carpenter from Nazareth, do you see him as he really was and is, or do you have a slightly distorted view? Have we added filters to make him appear brighter, darker, stronger, weaker than he actually was, is? See, this is what the people of Palestine were doing when they interacted with Jesus in Mark chapters 10 and 11. They had a twisted view of the Messiah because they added filters to their view of Jesus. Popular filters of the day that made people misunderstand who He was and who He is. And I want to make sure that we're not doing the same thing as we study Mark chapters 10 and 11. Really, these are the passages that start ripping off the filters of, of modern view of Jesus Christ. The first sermon in this four-week sermon series is entitled Misunderstanding Messiah, and it's a study of Mark chapter number one. Or excuse me, Mark chapter number 10, verses one and following. Let's go with a prayer into the Lord and, and ask Him to bless our time of study. Father in heaven, we've had a wonderful time of worshiping You through uh, tithes and offerings, through song and worship, through prayer, and now we come to You as, as we worship in a study of Your Word. As we study this passage from the Gospel of Mark, we pray that you would give us clear insight into its meaning. I pray, Father, that you would allow us to see the original intent of this passage. I pray, Father, in heaven, you would allow us to see your Son the way he is actually represented in the Bible. And I pray, Father, that we would remove the filters that we've placed over Jesus so that we can see who he was, who he is. And now, Holy Spirit of God, I humbly ask you to fill me with your presence and power to do even this morning what I know I cannot do. Cleanse me, fill me, use me so that I can help my friends study this word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I love the Grand Canyon. How many of you ever been to the Grand Canyon before? Raise your hand. If you haven't been, you gotta go. I love the Grand Canyon. It's beautiful. The average person that goes to the Grand Canyon, they say, drives hours and hours to be there. Some fly across the country to go to the Grand Canyon, and when they do and finally get there, they only view the Grand Canyon for 15 minutes. Wow. The average Grand Canyon visitor looks at the Grand Canyon for 15 minutes, and then they're like, that's it. It's a hole in the ground. <laughs> and then they go to the gift shop and they buy t-shirts. That's typical. 
But I love the Grand Canyon. I've had an opportunity of visiting multiple times growing up and throughout my life living so close, living in Las Vegas. You should take the opportunity. In fact, twice I've had the opportunity of actually traveling and hiking down into the canyon and hiking all the way out of the canyon, several day hiking trip through the canyon. I love the Grand Canyon. One time, not just too long ago, in fact, a few months ago, I was invited uh, to go on a river rafting tour the Grand, through the entire Grand Canyon. How many, of you, how many of you guys and gals out there would love to do that opportunity, right? Well, I got a call from a group called Answers in Genesis. Anybody familiar with Answers in Genesis? They're the people that built that big ark way out there in the middle of the country. And Answers in Genesis contacted us and said, hey, hey, would you like to go on this trip uh, down the Grand Canyon? And, and it's free. We're going we're gonna to sponsor you to go. Now, I, I thought it was a scam, because I, I had this situation, I had a bad experience with a Nigerian princess one time, and it just, <laughs> it did not go well. But sure enough, it actually found out it was true. They invited me to go on this river rafting tour. It was a geological survey study tour of the Grand Canyon with geologists, biologists, zoologists, uh, Hebrew scholars, Greek scholars, and a few pastors. And I was one of the ones that was selected to go on this trip. And I said, absolutely, you don't have to twist my arm. Let's do it. And so this happened just a few months ago. And what an incredible trip it was. The first thing I noticed when I got to meet some of the people on the trip, the night before, uh, two nights before we went down, we had an entire day day of study before we went down. And as I was getting to know these guys, the first thing I noticed is I was out of place. And what I mean by that, I was a little out of my element. So what do you mean? These guys were incredibly smart intellectuals. I mean, we're talking about the academic elite, brilliant men who know a lot about a lot of things. You say, well, pastor, aren't you an educated man? Not like these guys. Now, I'm no academic slouch. I mean, I have my, my college degree, and I have a master's in theology and another master's in divinity, and I've studied, but I'm telling you, I was out of place. Even in the normal conversations that we would have, these guys were brilliant and beyond compare, really genuinely. And, and so many times in the middle of the conversation, they'd be talking about something and I'd just be sitting. Have you been in a conversation, people are talking and you just kind of pretend to like, uh-huh? <laughs> you're like, you're picking up words. Several times they'd look over to me like, uh, Pastor, Pastor Tice, wh what do you think about uh, this conversation? And I would always have the same answer. I concur. I, <laughs> I concur with with the conciseness uh, of the elaborate, detailed plan of, of, does anybody want to go play ping pong? You know, I, I called Heather the night before we went down in the canyon. I'd been with these people for about 24 hours. I was about to be with them for seven days in the canyon, river rafting, and then doing, uh, we, we did geological study survey tour throughout the entire thing. And, um, and the night before I called Heather and she's like, man, how you doing? I said, I'm, I'm having a great time. She said, are you, are you meeting people? Now she knows that I get comfortable when I have friends when I meet people, I'm very social. And she says, have you met any friends? I'm like, yeah, kinda. She's like, what's, I said, they're really smart. And she says, yo, you're smart. I'm like, not this smart. And I said, Heather, it's like, it's like, it's like I'm, it's like I'm stuck in an episode of the Big Bang Theory. That's what it is. <laughs> Several days into the trip, I got comfortable enough to actually tell that joke. You know, everybody's like becoming my friends. And I'm like, you know what I feel like? And everybody's like, what? I said, I feel like I'm stuck in an episode of the Big Bang Theory. Nobody laughed. <laughs> Not one of them even knew what I was talking about. I'm like, what do, you, what do you do with all your time? And then the answer was read books. So I, <laughs> this was, but I learned a lot. I genuinely, I learned a lot. But the thing that I probably walked away with most is this simple truth, and that is the more you study the Grand Canyon, the more fascinating it becomes. And the more you look at it, the more you see what others don't see. Same is true with Jesus. Sometimes we don't see Jesus the way he really is because we're like the millions the casual fans, we take a glance at them, we see them for a couple minutes a day, a couple minutes a week. We're like those people who look at the canyon for 15 minutes and go buy a t-shirt. And this is why we see him improperly. Mark's gospel in chapters 10 and 11 before Jesus gets to Jerusalem and is crucified attempts 
to rip off the filters so that we can see the actual Jesus. I propose to you today that if you remove the filters, you'll see Jesus is more beautiful than you ever expected. And how then, how then, how then shall we see Jesus? How should we view Jesus? I want us to see first and foremost that he's the creator, not a religious leader. Will you say that with me today? Say that with me. I like a little participation from the audience. He's the creator, not a religious leader. Say it again, say it again. He's the creator, not a religious leader. Now you say, well, pastor, what's the big deal? Well, Mark is attempting through telling four quick stories, attempting to rip off filters, popular filters of the day. The first one was there were a lot of people that saw Jesus in his day and age as simply another religious leader. In fact, the other religious leaders thought Jesus was exactly the same thing. Oh, so you're a rabbi then. Then have a conversation with us about things we always argue about. And that's what happens in Mark chapter 10. These Pharisees, these religious leaders approach Jesus and try to get him to debate about divorce and remarriage. Look, look what it says in Mark chapter 10. You'll see the context. It says in verse 1, then Jesus arose from there and he came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan. He's on his way to Jerusalem. We're going to see next week he'll enter Jericho and then go up toward Jerusalem, which is in the hillsides. And it says in verse 2, then the Pharisees came to Jesus. Okay, these are the religious leaders of the day. And these people like to debate endlessly on religious topics. Have you ever met somebody so extremely religious? They just always ever wanted to debate on religious topics. That's who these people were. And they asked Jesus, is it lawful? This is how Pharisees talk, by the way. <laughs> is it lawful for man to divorce his wife? And they said this, testing Jesus. They didn't really care about Jesus' response. They're trying to trick him. They're trying to trap him. They do this all the time, these religious leaders. So they bring up a very popular conversation of the day. Jesus, is it okay for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Now, you have to understand the background of the conversation to really understand what's happening here. Let me state bluntly for those who have studied the Bible, for Christians, I do not believe that this is Jesus' definitive answer on divorce and remarriage. This passage is not about divorce and remarriage. This passage is about how people view Jesus. If you want definitive answers about divorce and remarriage, then you have to go to the commentary that the apostles place on the life of Jesus. That's what the book of Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, that's what they do. They give context to what Jesus' life was all about. This was never meant to be the definitive answer on divorce and remarriage. We get that in 1st Corinthians chapter 7 as Paul speaks about this incident. Okay, now with that being stated, what's happening? Jesus, is it okay for everybody to get divorced anytime they want? Here's the first filter we need to remove. Number one, he's the creator, not the religious leader. What was going on with the religious leaders of the day is they were having a debate on how easily you could divorce a woman. You see, technically, according to the Mosaic law, which is called the Torah, they were given permission to divorce their wives. In fact, that's exactly what happens. Look, it goes on. Jesus explains this exact part. He said unto them, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted that a man can write a certificate of a bill of divorcement and dismiss her. And Jesus answered, well, that's true because of the hardness of your hearts. What's happening here? These men were asking, could a man divorce his wife for any reason? Now, I told you that the Torah, which is written by Moses through the inspiration of God, allows for a writing of what's called a certificate of divorcement. Now, Moses did this because, well, because mankind is filled with sin. And to protect individuals in the midst of a broken relationship, something had to be allowed for. This is what Moses planned. But Jesus is going to bring up in a moment, from the beginning, that was not the original plan. The original plan was one man with one woman for one lifetime. That was God's original plan. Now, what the Pharisees had done that you may not be aware of, part of this historic conversation, was that the Pharisees had written what's called a commentary on the Torah. It was called the Talmud. Now, the Torah, if it was about that big, the Talmud would be about that big. 
It's a bunch of stories and explanations for what they believe the writings of Moses to say. And part of the Talmud taught the, these individuals, these religious leaders, where Moses gives a writing of bill of divorcement, they taught that a man could divorce his wife for any reason, literally, quote unquote, even if she burns the dinner soup. Now, you have to understand, this was in a patriarchal society where a woman had no recourse. She had no standing under the law. She could not go and say, hey, he's divorced me. All he did was burn the soup. And the answer is a man can divorce his wife for anything. And so this was the conversation they wanted Jesus to enter into. And these Pharisees, the hypocrites that they were, were treating women in this society deplorably. And they were allowing their women to be divorced literally if a man just didn't like her anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah. She burned dinner. Get rid of her. And now this woman becomes destitute and absolutely poverty stricken. And they want to find out from Jesus his thoughts. And Jesus says, what did Moses say? He said we could write, write a billing of divorcement. Yeah, he told you that because you're all a bunch of sinners. But from the beginning, it was not so. God made one man and one woman for one lifetime. Don't you understand? You're not supposed to be divorcing your wives. That's what Jesus is saying. In fact, he even goes further in verses 11 and, uh, chapter, uh, verses, uh, 11 and 12, or verse 10. Look what it says. And the, in the house, his disciples also asked him about this matter. So the disciples are like, wait, wait, wait. Are you saying there should be no divorce? Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery against him. What Jesus is saying is, hey, fellas, I know what Moses told you, but this was not the original plan. The original plan was one man for one woman for one lifetime. And these religious leaders think they're better than everybody else because they're technically following the Torah. And I'm not going to play their games. Jesus says, if you want to know the truth, we should go back to the way it was in Garden of Eden. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm the creator. I'm not one of your religious leaders. Now, some of you are really wanting to know more about this. Well, wait a second. What about it? And Christians have all sorts of different opinions on this. Again, I do not see this as a definitive passage on divorce and remarriage. If you want to see that, Paul talks about what happens with somebody when they are in that relationship and how this kind of thing plays out in the local church. This is not the only passage on this. The, uh, what it, Jesus is saying in this passage clearly and what Mark is trying to help us understand is that he's not simply one of the religious leaders who get caught up in these stupid arguments. He's the creator. He's not a legalist. He's an originalist. And when you take off the filters, you start to see him more clearly. That's really what's going on in the Gospel of Mark. Because we see this not only in the first story, we see it in the second story, Mark chapter 10, verse 13 and following. Look at what Mark chapter 10, verse 13 and following says. It says, first one is he's the creator, not a religious leader. The second point I want you to see is he's a friend, not a celebrity. Now say that one with me today. He's a friend, not a celebrity. Say it again, say it again with some passion. He's a friend, not a celebrity. Now, Mark is trying to express this is the way people view Jesus. And here's the reality. That's the way some people view Jesus. Some people think he's just a religious leader. Some people think he's just some kind of a religious celebrity. In fact, that was the misconception the disciples had about Jesus. Because suddenly their crowds grew to thousands and thousands, and they began to feel like they weren't followers of Jesus as much as they were a security team, keeping people away from Jesus. Look what happens in Mark chapter 10, verse 13. And they brought little children to him, all the crowd, they begin to, how many of you, if you had a toddler, you would want to bring that toddler to Jesus? Amen? If Jesus was around, it'd be like, Jesus, bless my child. Jesus, tell my child not to be such a brat all the time. You know, it's, it's a toddler, right? So they bring the children to Jesus, and the Bible says, the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Now, this is fascinating. You can imagine, children are children. And not all of them are probably acting exactly the way they ought act. I, by the, I've stood in lines, all sorts of lines, to allow my children to meet celebrities. We call it Disneyland. <laughs> Come on, we're going to meet Mickey Mouse. We're going to meet Minnie Mouse. And then you bring the child in front of Mickey Mouse and they scream. Aah! Imagine this is what's going on. 
And so the disciples have a little staff meeting. And they're like, you know what? We have a little staff meeting. We got to make sure that Jesus isn't wasting his time with all of these people. Let's do this. We're going to block him off so that nobody talks to Jesus. And he's kind of a, you know, he's a big shot now. And so they tell the people, look what it says. He, they, they start shooing away the crowd, and the, and, but Jesus saw it, and he was greatly displeased. That means he was upset with them. And he said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. He says, let them come. Don't you understand? They are the kingdom of God. And then he even goes even further. This is fascinating. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive, uh, receive me, the, uh, receive the kingdom of God as a little child, will in no means enter it. He said, look, in fact, if you don't come to me like one of these little children do, then you'll never even get to heaven. What does that mean? That means what God, I should say Jesus Christ and the Father are looking for, they're looking for childlike faith. You say, what's a childlike faith? I was a children's pastor. I love children's ministry. I love what they're doing up in Kidopolis even now. They're teaching children the stories of Jesus. You know, what cho- you know what adults do when you teach them the stories of Jesus? They're like this. <laughs> Prove it to me. <laughs> Entertain me. Tell another joke. <laughs> Impress me. <laughs> you know what children are? When you tell, there's a man named Jesus, and he loves you, and he's the one who created everything. And the Bible says that we've all made mistakes. We've all sinned and broken God's law. Have you ever made mistakes? Have you ever disobeyed mom and dad? Have you ever lied? Have you ever taken something that wasn't yours? Well, the Bible says God loves you anyway, but your sin has to be paid for. And so the Bible says that God loved you so much, he sent his son Jesus to die for you. And Jesus loves you so much, he was willing to die and pay for all of your sins. But he didn't stay dead. He was buried and rose from the grave because he's powerful. He's the creator. And now Jesus wants you to live with him forever. And all you have to do is admit that you've made mistakes, sin, believe that he died for you, rose from the grave, and ask him to save you. Do you want to do that? You know what I've noticed with children? Children are like, yeah, duh. <laughs> like, of course I want to be saved. You say, yeah, but they're, they're, so, they're, so, they're so innocent. They don't know any better. Yeah, and you're doing great. <laughs> so Jesus says, if you want to come to me, you have to come to me with that innocence, that sweet spirit. You have to come to me by faith. And then the Bible says Jesus picked up all these children and he began to bless them. Can I tell you something, my dear friend? Jesus is not a celebrity. He's your friend. He's the one who loves you. He's the one who died for you. He's the one who was buried and rose from the grave. And now he offers an intimate relationship with him. If you're new to church, this is not about learning a new religion. It's about starting a relationship with a person who is living and alive today and can live and work and breathe in you and through you. I'm telling you, friend, we've got to take off this filter. He's not a celebrity. He is a friend. Number three, what are these filters that Mark wants us to see? He's saying Jesus is not just a religious leader. He's the creator. He's not a celebrity. He's a friend. And number three, Mark wants us to see he's a disciple maker, not a wish granter. You see, when you finally realize, okay, 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 he's not simply this this celebrity. He's actually my friend. Then you begin to see him a little bit more clearly than you've ever seen him before. And then you begin to say, well, wait a second, wait a second. If Jesus is all powerful and he can do all things and there's some things that I need, then I'm gonna go to him. And like a genie in a bottle, we become Aladdin and we say, hey, 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 can you give me? This is what happens in the next story. In the next story, the Bible says that Jesus is entering uh, an area referred to as Jericho. Look what it says in verse 17. And as he was going out on the road, one came running and knelt down before Jesus and said unto him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, you don't see this in the moment because 
you don't know everything about this man. But here's the beautiful thing about Jesus. Jesus knows everything about this young man because Jesus has known this man being the creator since his very conception, since his very birth. And he's watched him throughout his life. And Jesus knows who this man is. This man is referred to as the rich young ruler. Now you say, who's the rich young ruler? I'll describe him. He's rich. He's young. And he's a ruler. Like literally, he was one of the wealthy folk in the community. We would have called him part of the one percent. He's young. He didn't spend his life trying to get this money. Now he's got lots of money and no health. He's got mo- both health and wealth. And not only is he rich and young, he's a ruler. He's one of the most important people in the society. He's actually part of the governmental system of some, some kind. And he is an important man. He's got everything. And he brings everything he has to Jesus. And he realizes there's one thing I don't have. I've got it so well off, I'm a little nervous. Death, I know, is coming. Maybe he had just been to a funeral. Maybe he had just seen a friend pass away. And he thinks to himself, I've got everything I could possibly want. There's one thing I don't have and that is I don't have eternal life. What if I die? Then I won't have all this stuff anymore. Ah, Jesus. Jesus. Hey, Jesus. Hey, hey, Jesus. I heard that you can give me eternal life. Jesus, can you give it to me? Verse 18. So Jesus says to the young man, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. I love this. Jesus loves the young man, but he wants to get at the point. Good teacher, tell me, how can I earn eternal life for myself? Oh, great question. First, you call me good. There's only one good but God. Are you calling me God? Whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus wants to see if this young man is viewing him properly through the right perspective. He goes on. You know the commandments, young man. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. That means to lie. Do not defraud. Do honor your father and mother. Let me ask you a question. If you walked up to Jesus and said to Jesus, I want to earn eternal life for myself, what do I do? And Jesus said, okay. You need to never sin, never break any of God's commandments, be a perfect person from birth till death, and then you'll earn eternal life. What would you say to this? Hopefully you would say, oh no, this is not a good moment. Look at what this arrogant man says. Jesus says, you want to earn eternal life? Never sin. And this is what this man says. Look what he says. He says to him, Jesus looking at him, said, loved him uh, he says unto him, oh, verse 20, and he answered and said unto him, teacher, all these things have I kept from my youth. All right, you want to earn eternal life? Here's what you are. You need to be perfect, never sin, always do the right thing. Well, Jesus, you're talking to the right guy because I've never done anything wrong. Nothing you need to know about. I'm doing pretty good. See, we need to add a few more adjectives to this man. He's not just a rich, young ruler. He's a rich, young, arrogant, prideful, sinful man who believes himself to be better than others, who believes he can earn his own salvation and just wants to have Jesus as an add-on in his life. Jesus is not a religious leader who all you need to do is pay him a little bit more and he'll dole out eternal life. So what does he say? Teacher, all of these things have I kept from my youth. And Jesus looked at him, loved him. By the way, aren't you thankful that Jesus even loves the arrogant ones? Can I get an amen from, from some of us arrogant ones? Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, one thing you lack. All right, you seem like a pretty perfect person. There's only one thing you better do. Go your way and sell whatever you have. <laughs> this is great. Sell whatever you have, give it to the poor. That's a hard thing to tell a guy with everything. Okay, everything you have, give it up, give it up. It's not yours anymore. Sell it, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and take up your cross and follow me. 
Okay, you've done pretty good so far. Only one thing to do now. Everything you have, I want you to sell it and give it to the poor. Now, there have been some who have looked at this passage incorrectly, and they've said, see here, Jesus is teaching. All you have to do is sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you've earned eternal life. You totally misread this passage. Jesus is not saying you can earn your salvation through good works. He's saying if you want to earn your salvation through good works, you better be absolutely perfect in all things. And he's pointing out that this young man is not perfect. He has all of this stuff. He was perfect. He'd sell it all and give it to the poor. And notice he doesn't just say sell all you have and give it to the poor. He says also pick up your cross and follow me. Hey, 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 pal. I'm not here to be your wish granter. I'm here to be a disciple maker. If you want me, then follow me. Where are you going, Jesus? To the crown? No, I'm going to the cross. Hey, one of the big filters that Christians in America have today is that we are looking for wish granter Jesus, not disciple maker Jesus. The problem is if you're looking for wish granter Jesus, he doesn't exist. And so, but he, the Bible says in verse 22, but he was very sad at this word and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. See, like a genie in a bottle, this man attempted to use Jesus, use Jesus, use Jesus. If I get Jesus, he'll give me what I really want. No, 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 no. If you get Jesus, you'll have what you always really wanted. You see, the reward of getting Jesus is not what Jesus can give you. The reward of getting Jesus is Jesus. And those who are disciples of Jesus are learning this truth. I, I really connect to this misconception because as a pastor in Las Vegas, I've seen it so many times. I've seen a woman, I, many times I've seen this. Heather and I will see a woman come and they'll be like, oh, pastor, I'm in trouble. He left me. I need to get him back. I need him so bad in my life. Tell me, I'll do anything. I'll read my Bible. I'll pray. I'll come to church. I'll join a small group. I'll do anything to get him back. You don't want Jesus. You want your real God, and you want to use Jesus to get what you really worship. Right. We know this because the very moment you get back what you really want, you leave Jesus behind. Say, Pastor, you can't talk like this. You're going to make people go away from, from the message. Jesus did the same thing. Jesus constantly would preach to large crowds, and many people would be fed by the bread, and they would see the miracles, and large crowds would gather. But then Jesus thinned the herd, as it were. How did he do it? By saying, if you really want to follow me, you need to know what it really costs. I've not just seen it with women, my dear friend. I've seen it with men constantly. Their business gets in trouble. Their finances are in trouble. So they come to Jesus. They come to Jesus. Pastor, you got to help me. Man, I'm in trouble. I mean, i got my situation all in a mess. i got to tell you, i got to get my business back in order, my life back in order. I'll do anything. I'll read my Bible. I'll pray. I'll come to church. I'm going to join a small group. I'll do anything to get my business back in order. Oh, you got to help me. And then their business gets back in order. They got their real God, and they leave Jesus. You didn't want Jesus. You wanted what Jesus could get you. Let me ask you a question if you're there right now. Excuse me as I'm being a little confrontational. I'm representing Christ in this moment. Hear me. Hear me. Why would Jesus give you your real God so that you can dethrone him and place your real idol in his place? Why would he give it back to you? Instead of seeking what Jesus can give you, seek Jesus. You say, well, where does the Bible say that? It's the entire message of the Bible, but I'll tell you one passage that comes to mind. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of those other things, they'll be added unto you. It's not saying that you'll never have those things. It's saying that they are subsequent blessings. If you seek first God's kingdom, do you see? This filter is huge in America. I would say it is a major problem in Christianity in Las Vegas, and that is Jesus is not simply a wish granter. I broke it. <laughs> oh, no, there it is. All right. Jesus is not simply a wish granter. He's a disciple maker. 
And suddenly, whenever you get rid of that filter, you can actually begin to see Jesus for who he really is. Okay, let's move on to the last point so we can close out. Here it is, number four. How should we see Jesus? He's a savior, not a safety net. Say it with me, say it with me. He's a savior, not a safety net. You say, I'm a little confused right now, pastor, because these filters that you're taking off, it's messing with my religious perspective. All right, you're not alone, and I love you. Jesus and his disciples, the disciples were confused too. They're like, what's that thing about divorce? And, and what about these, these children? Well, I don't get it. Like, you're down there with the people, and, and I don't understand what you just told that rich young ruler. Are you telling me he's to earn his way to salvation? And so Jesus takes his disciples privately and explains, and this is the last story that we're going to look at today. Look at what it says. Jesus pulls his disciples away privately and talks about that guy. Look what he says in verse 23. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter into the kingdom of God? What Jesus is saying, hey, that guy, that rich young ruler you just talked to, we just talked to, that guy's not even saved. He didn't want a savior. He wanted a safety net. Hey, Jesus, look at all this stuff I've got and all these things I've done. It's pretty good, right? Hey, hey, come here. I know you'd be pretty lucky to have me on your team. These are all the things I have to offer. And just in case I don't get this whole eternal life thing, you know, I think I might, but in case I don't, could I add you to my cart? Friend, hear me. If you're new to this Jesus thing, he's not something you add to your cart as you're shopping in Amazon. Right. He's not an add-on to your meal at a restaurant. He's not a safety net in case you don't get there. He is the Savior. He wants to be the only thing you have. How hard is it for a man who is rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard is it for those who trust in their riches to enter the kingdom of God? Hey, you cannot trust in what you bring to God to get you to heaven. The only thing you can trust to get you to heaven is what Jesus Christ has done for you upon the cross. And so look, the Bible says his disciples were extremely shocked by this. Look what it says in verse 26. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Wait, Jesus, if you're telling me that rich people can't get to heaven, then who can get to heaven? And Jesus says, that's exactly the point. Look what it says in the final verses on the, on the screen. It says, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Amen. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, it's impossible for you to get to heaven without going through the way, the truth, the life, that is Jesus Christ. Amen. There's only one way to heaven, and that is through the very Son of God, His name, Jesus Christ. He came from heaven and died upon the cross for your sins and mine sins. He was buried, and He rose from the grave, and He offers you salvation. You say, I'll get to heaven another way. There is no other way. You say, well, I'm a pretty good person. Well, good luck with that. No, I mean that. I'm not trying to be mean. If you're good enough to get to heaven, go for it. Say, I'm not good enough. I mean, I'm not perfect. I mean, I've got a lot of good to offer God. I just need him as a safety net. He's not a safety net. He's a savior. See, this is what people do, rich people, whether you're rich with money or you're rich with religious deeds or you're rich on your self-righteous indignation about everybody else. This is what we do. We come to Jesus with all that we have to offer, arms full, and we say, okay, Jesus, just in case I'm not good enough to get there, I need you. And you'll die and go to hell. You get saved when you throw it all away and you come to him and say, I don't have anything to offer you. I tried to be religious and I failed. I tried to do well, good and I, I failed. I tried to love people and I failed. I tried to be what I need to be and I'm a failure. I'm a failure. The only thing I need is a savior. God, will you save me because I can't save myself? And some of you might be thinking, well, I'm not there. Then you're not ready to get saved. You can't get saved until you finally realize, I have nothing to offer you. 
nothing good in myself. The apostle Paul said, I've got good things. I was a Pharisee. I was a religious leader. I was a professor of the law. But in reality, when I look at all of it, he said, I count it but dung. That means I think of all the good that I have like uh, like garbage, yet it was extremely more vulgar, what, what, what Paul said. That's true. He said, everything good I have to offer God is like garbage. I come to Jesus and say, I have nothing. You're not a safety net. You're everything. You're my Savior. When you get there, that's salvation. Are you there? Friend, have you been saved? Have you been born again? Maybe today God is humbling your heart. Don't fight it. Be humbled. Rip off the filter of safety net. Some of us grew up with this filter. That's how we've always seen them. I've got Jesus just in case. No, you have Jesus and that's all you have. Jesus plus nothing. And then when you see him for who he really is, suddenly you see the beauty of who he really is. I love the Grand Canyon. I really do. Like I said, I've had an opportunity of traveling down twice just through hiking and then once another time through the canyon on a river tour. Now, something interesting takes place at the end of every time down below the rim. When you go down below the rim, you begin to see the canyon in a way that very few people have a chance to see the canyon and know the canyon. And then as you come back up, after days of hunger and days of exhaustion and days of, of long hikes, and you smell like you've been in the canyon for a week because you've been in the canyon for a week, you enter into the gift shops of the canyon and you see the 15-minute people. We call them the above the rimmers. <laughs> These are the people that are stopping in, you see. And they do appreciate it somewhat. You know, they walk over, they look and they're like, well, how, what about this? Look at this. Isn't that a nice canyon? It's a hole in the ground. Isn't it beautiful? There's a squirrel. There's a squirrel. You have squirrels at home. Look at the canyon. Look at it. And then they go buy a gift shop and then they leave. There's something in the eye of somebody who's been below the rim that is not in the eye of those who just take a glance because they've taken time to look at what it really is. Let me ask you a question. When you see Jesus, do you see him for what he really is? <laughs> the deeper you look, the more beautiful he becomes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the word that you've taught us today. Dear God, It's impacting us to see us, to see ourselves the way we see you. It's, it's so wrong often. And over these four weeks, as you break down the preconceptions we have of you, I pray that we would see you for who you are and not for the popular filters that have been placed upon you. No filters. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connectdesk at southernhillslv.com. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhillslv.com slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach God's people around the world.